everyone. Hi. Hello from the most haunted podcast in America. This is Two Girls, One Ghost. Two Girls, One Ghost. And we are your ghostesses. That is Corinne. Hello. And I am Sabrina. And we have a story for all of you. Uh, yeah. Did you t- have to take a second to think about it? I did because so much has happened to us. I feel like every <laughs> other city brings us hauntings, but you're right. There was one city that brought us the most, and that was Dallas. And one person who perhaps brought this upon us. And that would be Pain. Pain Lindsay. Pain Lindsay. <laughs> We're blaming pain. I said we're going to blame you if anything happens, and then something did. So there we go. Yes. So pain has a new podcast coming out in November, I think a couple weeks after this episode comes out, called Talking to Death. And he's just talking to a bunch of people, and it's a bunch of different conversations. He had Corinne and I on his show while we were in Dallas. We recorded Mm -hmm. in Barbie's dream house, Mojo Dojo Casa. Literally, that's what the Airbnb looked like. We just talked about ghost stories and it was good fun. And then all of a sudden, Payne's like, I have a surprise for you. And he brings out a mini, tiny, little, cute Ouija board because Hasbro has like all those mini games that they make and they make a Ouija board one. And he was like, should we play? And I am shocked, Corinne, that you were convinced. I wish it took more convincing. In fact, I think you guys barely even tried to get me to play. It just was so small and so incredibly plastic and so cute. It just looked like it would barely budge. And so I was like, you know what? I feel like this isn't even real. Like, sure, I'll give it a go. If he pulled out a big one, there's no way, no way I would have done it. But yeah, for some reason I did. It was mini. And so for me, I was like, mini equals less power. Sure. (laughs) Innocent. Cute and innocent. Innocent. Cute. It's basically an ornament. Like, it is so small. (laughs) So, yeah, we all put our shaky hands, our shaky fingers on this little mini Ouija board, and nothing happened. Yeah. And the episode will come out, I don't know when, but in the next couple of months, so people can watch what actually happened, which is very little. And so we were like, okay, we made sure to follow all the rules. We set our intentions. We said goodbye. We did everything right. Mm -hmm. And... Nothing really happened, and he's like, well, this is for you. It's now – you can take it home. Ouija board on the go. And so I put it into my backpack, which had my laptop. Which had our live show on it, which was only on your desktop, which was not saved anywhere else. For context, we have been using my computer – at this point, it's been 20-plus shows – Yes. The only issues we've had are when venues and their connectivity issues, like they can't work with Macs or something like that. And then I learn how to use a soundboard and become a techie. Right. That's really the only issues we've had. Which I guess the answer to that is it's not that the venues can't work with Macs. It's that they just don't know how because you do always fix it. Yes. So – So we've had no issues in terms of my computer. My computer has been working totally fine. It's pretty brand new. I mean, I got it four or five months ago. In all regards, it should be functioning perfectly. We used it at the Houston show. Zero problems. I put it into my backpack after the Houston show. It was fully charged. Then after using this Ouija board and having a conversation with Payne, we go to the Dallas venue. Mm -hmm. And we are setting up the stage, doing our thing. You do your merch as you do. Like we have our routine. We know what we do. I do sound check. You do merch. Yes. Right. I set up the stage and I grab my computer and I open it and it won't turn on. And if you have a Mac, you know, like when the keypad won't like click and stuff, you know, it's dead. And I was like, okay, well that that's weird, but maybe it just, I don't know, something was running in the background and it died overnight which shouldn't happen. But then I was like, oh, that's fine. I'll just go grab my charger. Mm -hmm. But my charger won't light up. I plug it into my computer and nothing. I am like, what the heck? I'm trying all of these things and nothing is working. I am trying not to panic. So I go up to Corinne and I'm like, I grab you with my like arms, like very like you could, you could probably feel the energy of stress. You (laughs) were 
fully panicked. I know you're trying not to panic, but you were like wide-eyed, gripping me, like leaving marks in my arms, being like, (laughs) I need your laptop charger because either my computer is just dead and I need a new charger or my computer is dead. Like it won't turn on. Like it's broken. And I was like, okay, okay. Because at first I was like, I've had so many issues with venues outlets where I'm like, okay, it takes like the fourth outlet that I try for it to actually charge. I'm like, just try a different outlet. Sure. I'll go grab my thing. I tried five outlets. Yeah. I did not think I was like, it's an outlet thing for sure. So nothing's working. And no. luckily you had an older version of the show on your computer because every time we've tried to back it up, it says like four hours to upload into the Google Drive or somewhere. So like we just – We haven't. And because we've been moving and on the go, we, we don't had have four, four hours, hours to, to sit, sit somewhere. There. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Anyway, my computer is broken. I see it's now 5.15. Doors open at 6 p.m. for this show. I see that there is an Apple store a mile away. And I'm like, Corinne, you finish setting up with your computer. I am going to run to Apple. And I've never driven a truck before. And I felt like I turned into a true Texan. I (laughs) was driving. I get in your truck, this big truck. I rented us a Ford F-150. Yeah. All of a sudden, I had a twang. It's a petite truck. It's a Ford F-150, which I guess maybe truck people out there, they're going to yell at me. But my parents have a like a bus, like a Greyhound bus of a yeah. truck. So I felt like it was tiny when I was driving it, but you felt like it was very big when you were driving yeah. it. Yeah. All of a sudden I had spurs and like country music <laughs> came on. Assless chaps. <laughs> Hay barrels <laughs> flying through the street. I have like Bucky's, what are they, beaver nuggets coming out of my mouth. Beaver nuggets. Yeah. Kissing Kate Barlow was trying to hitchhike on the side. <laughs> I like flies the Apple store and I get there and it's packed. And also like I couldn't get an uh, an appointment because it's 5.30 and it closes at six and it is packed. Like I've never seen an Apple store this packed. This woman sees me and she's helping another customer. She goes, are you okay? And I was like, um, yes and no. But like if someone could help me, that would be great. And she was like, okay, go over there. And they were like, no one really can help. But then the manager came over because they could tell I was so stressed. So this guy comes and he's like, let me take this back to the back room. I'll plug it into the charger for like 10 minutes. I'll do like a software. I'll just run all these tests. Mm -hmm. I'm communicating with you. I'm also telling Payne that he cursed us (laughs) because I'm realizing that the only thing that changed was that I put a Ouija board in my backpack next to my laptop. And all of a sudden, it is now not working. Before we went over to record, he texted us and he said, I have a gift for you. And then that was the gift. And so before he came to our show, I texted and I said, we have a gift for you because we were given that shit back. Yeah, we were. And I had to do sound check without you and I've never done it before. So it was just like trying to figure out sound check as you're being told basically by Apple that this has almost never happened before and that your computer's brain died. Died. So yeah, the guy comes back to me and he's like, I can't get it on. I can't even run tests on it. I am so sorry. This is so unusual. I've maybe seen this once before. I don't know why it happens, but the logic center probably is gone and you need to get replaced. And he's like, you need to leave it here. And I was like, I'm leaving at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. So I took it with me and I come back to the venue in Dallas and I am like, well, good thing we have at least an old version we can use on your computer. And I plug it into my charger And I'm like, I'm just going to leave it back here, like plugged in and see what happens. And then I saw there was a bag of crystals in my bag. And I was like, I'm just going to put this bag of crystals on top of the computer. Let's see what happens. Like not what, 90 seconds later? We were just talking and it goes bloop, bloop. And I was like, like, did "Did you you hear hear that? that? And I said, no, because I I truly didn't. (laughs) And you look down and you're like, no, my computer is on and the light is on and you grab it and you open it. And there it is, the login screen. Totally on. Fine. Fine Fine-ish, because then the crystal saved it partially. But then we put it up on stage. And again, you brought up the little mini Ouija board to tell the story and basically gift it to whoever wanted this haunted object, which someone did. Yeah. But yeah, so the crystals were there, but so was the Ouija board. And so I think they were both battling each other on stage. And the videos would work, but the sound would not. So we did have to restart our 
show like 18 times and then <laughs> finally move it over to my laptop again. I like ran over to the stage and I was like, everyone close your eyes. <laughs> I switched the computers. <laughs> I, I will say the reason that that happened with the sound is because of a setting that we had to change when we were at the Houston show for the sound to work. So I think I needed to change the sound setting so that it was going through the aux cord. And oh, okay. we hadn't done that because I didn't do sound check with my computer because it was broken until later. And so then I took my computer to Apple. And again, they're like, there's literally nothing wrong with it. Literally nothing. You just took it back and they said nothing? Yeah. They ran every test. Yesterday wasn't something happening again where you're like, my computer's barely working? Yeah. Did the same exact thing where it wouldn't turn on. Hmm. So I've been doing a lot of cleansings and I want to actually, before we start this episode, our listener Sherry, who's also a Patreon donor, made us the gave us these like velvet bags in Austin and they had a bunch of like little like goodies in it. And this is a ghost cleanser spray and it's Palo Santo, frankincense, sandalwood, and H2O. And I've been spraying it. Sabrina's been spraying it around her apartment, but backstage, you sprayed it just in the green room, and Dylan from Tenderfoot TV and Payne were back there, and you were like, do you want some? And they just take it and spray it on themselves, like cologne, like, ch -ch 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 -ch. I think Dylan <laughs> basically drank it. He went like this and sprayed it right <laughs> into his mouth. <laughs> We're like, are you guys okay? Because we're not. Nothing that's happening right now is normal. <laughs> yeah. So bizarre. Oh, my gosh. It's so bizarre. That show was so fun, though, because we also had some fellow podcast friends there. I mean, Payne and Dylan were there. But then also from Shook, Amanda was there. And then mm -hmm. Christy and Heather from Sinisterhood. I was so yeah. stoked that we got to see them because they're from Dallas. It was really fun. And then also Lainey Hobbs came. And I was staring at Lainey so much during the show because she was right dead center. And then after when we saw her, she was like, every time you looked at me, I was like, ew, stop looking at me. Because I was just <laughs> staring at her every time there was a video playing, just in silence, just making steady eye contact. Oh, my gosh. We also need to talk about <laughs> what? what that person said to me at the meet and greet. Okay, I've literally <laughs> never had this happen to me. So... At the meet and greet, and I, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting their names, but this couple comes up and I remember I was like so excited. I, the girl was wearing this like black velvet dress and I was like, oh my gosh, your dress is so beautiful. And I hug her and then I go and introduce myself to her partner and he goes, with all due respect, and he says it with his like Southern drawl, you freak me out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then he goes on to say, when I had gone to switch the computers when I came back and, and mine was working. I apparently like snuck by him and he said that like he's never cold and the moment I passed him, he was freezing. And even when we were up on stage, he was kind of like, he was definitely hovering more towards me and when we took the picture, he like stood by me and his girlfriend was in between him and you and he was yeah. definitely feeling, yeah, ice cold around you. I freaked him out. Yeah. I've never experienced that before. Usually it's like yeah. people walking into me. Or maybe that's why people ignore me because I freak them out. I don't know. <laughs> well, his girlfriend was like, I could see on her face. She was like, oh, like, don't. Why are you saying this to them? Like, she, we enjoyed it. I thought it was hilarious. I thought it was funny. You yeah. also thought it was funny. I could tell that she was nervous. Like, oh, my God, why are you saying this? What if they hate us? <laughs> no, you're memorable. I'm super memorable. So let me know. Do I freak you out? Freaky deaky Sabrina. <laughs> freak a leak. Uh, well, we have some freaky stories for this episode because we do. We were just thinking while we were on tour about the beginnings of our podcast and what happened before we even started the podcast and kind of like the shows we would watch, the things we would read online, and just our desire to be creepy, deep, deep, deep into like creepy, spooky stories and how you yeah. can so easily go down a rabbit hole online, specifically in Reddit. So we yeah. were like, let's find some real stories, some ones that people are saying are true on Reddit and read those spooky ghost stories because it feels a little bit like we're going back to our, our roots pre-podcast of what we used to seek yeah. out to be scared. Yeah. And then we'll kind of have some discussions of like, what do we think? True story, just a creepy Reddit story, or this is just going to be a good fun time. Do you want to go first? Okay. Sure. Great. 
So the theme, I'll just say right up front, the, the theme that I kind of chose was stories that teeter on the line of, is this just a technology glitch? Is this a human being dangerous? Or is this truly a paranormal experience? So I liked it oh. kind of being somewhere in the middle where you're questioning what exactly happened to you. Okay, fun. So I will start out with one called Creepy Alexa Experience. Oh, the, okay. I love these stories. Yes. This is from Mystical Cheese Balls. <laughs> I love Reddit usernames. Me too. Also, I have a random Reddit username. I don't even know what it is, but it's like Mr. Dixie 729 or whatever. Like it just gave it to me and I get confused every time I log in because I've never changed it. Mr. Dixie. I'm like, who is this? Who did I hack into? Who's Mr. Dixie? It's me. I'm Mr. It's Dixie. It's you. Now we know. I don't really remember if that's my name, but it feels right. Okay. Yeah. So this happened about six to seven years ago when I got an Alexa for Christmas that year. My parents are old school. And my dad was strictly against having an Alexa even taken out of the box. And so it took months of begging and pleading before I could set it up with conditions, of course. It had been in my room only, nowhere else in the house, only in my room. And when I was not speaking to it or using it, it was either on mute or unplugged. Those were the conditions. Do not talk personal matters around it, like family matters, passwords, addresses, were not to be said around the Alexa, even if it was muted. So with those rules and probably a few more, I got to set up my Alexa. I had discovered a while after having it that you could play some guessing games on it. Being an only child at home and bored 99% of the time, I used this feature a lot and honestly almost too much. One night, while I was playing some guessing game and playing a game on my iPad, I'd gotten a question wrong. I don't remember the question or what I answered. I only remember what Alexa said. Oh, no. It said something along the lines of, wrong, now listen close. Obviously, this catches my attention and I stop what I'm doing and I look over to my Alexa. Right on cue, she continues in this horrifying whisper, raspy voice, don't look behind you. <gasps> Needless to say, I unplugged my Alexa and I refused to use it for months, even years after that. And then someone asked, did you look behind you? And Mystical Cheese Balls said, I didn't. I was on my bed, which was in the corner of the room at the time. So the only thing behind me was my wall, unless it was a scene from Stranger Things with the hand coming out of the wall. I don't like that. I feel like we've talked about a lot of paranormal games, and I feel like this mm -hmm. is the beginning of one. Like, there should be a new paranormal game where you use the Alexa. Like, Alexa is part of the paranormal game. That's so smart, especially because it can be so creepy, like not actually knowing. Oh, can we code it? Can we be? <laughs> I want us, <laughs> I want us to be in charge of what and how it responds. Navigates a scary situation. Yes. That's actually very smart. You know how there was someone who I saw it on like TikTok or YouTube or something. It was like years ago. Someone was like, here's how I set up my Alexa for if there's a break-in. And if when they like set their house to away mode, if there was motion detected or like the door opened, it would trigger Alexa to say like, hello, I've been waiting for you. Do you want to play a game? And then they're like, let the bodies hit the floor. Let the bodies hit the floor. Rah! Would start in like red lights, like all these colorful lights. And it was, it was like a murder house. It was so freaky. That's terrifying. It is. But I feel like what would be even freakier is like if – there was no real, no clear intention. You just had a bunch of Alexas set up where in each room, like at based on where you were in the house, a different Alexa would go off and say something creepy. Like, oh, you chose that way? Interesting. <laughs> and just, you're just creating like a haunted house in your own house. Like yeah. I imagine that like you accidentally set off your alarm and this starts happening <laughs> and you just like literally can't stop it and you have to get through all of this. Your eight-year-old niece is just trying to go get a glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> and that is how you traumatize family. Yes. Oh, man. Okay. Okay. I th also think mine are different enough that I want to switch back and forth. So why don't you go next? Okay, fine. I'll go next. So my first one is from Nuclear Hubris, and it was posted four years ago. I have zero theme to all of my stories. I basically read so many different Reddit forums and just found ones that creeped me out. I love it. 
I was driving across country with my mom and sister. I was 16, my sister 20, and my mom was in her 50s. It was late, but we were well-rested and still very alert. We were driving along an interstate and needed gas, and my sister and mom needed to pee. So we stopped at the only rest stop in about 200 miles. There was a van full of teenagers on some road trip and a small gray compact car, like a Honda Accord or something. They were all parked at this gas station, and this Honda was at the pump right in front of us. I noticed that there were two men, about 17 to 20, who were standing outside the Honda in hoodies, standing very statue-like, very still. And the Hmm. teenagers were to our left. The second we got there, everything felt wrong. There was a deep and unsettling feeling about the place, and we had not felt that way at any other rest stop. We had been on the road for days and seen many rest stops at night, and I had never been afraid until that moment. My mom and sister went inside, and I stayed in the car. I listened, and I heard the teenagers saying that they were really creeped out and couldn't get the gas pump to work, so they loaded up in the car and left in a hurry. I was mostly watching the car in front of me and the two men who had still not moved at all. Not Mm. an inch. Creepy. They were not talking. They were not on phones. There was no light anywhere but the dim overhead lights on the gas station awning. They were just standing there, fucking still, like stone. Okay, I will say just really quickly that I feel like you and I, from our exhaustion from tour, have been these people a couple times. (laughs) Oh, 100%. Multiple times. Yeah. So it's possible, but I'm curious. Let's see. Sunday when I was flying back from Dallas to LA, the amount of people who, like one person was like, are you okay? I was like, no. No. There's nothing in here. I'm (laughs) empty. Okay. My sister and mom came running back out to the car. And when they got in, those two men finally moved. They slowly turned to look at us, but they were not moving or pivoting the rest of their bodies. And I swear, we all saw the same thing. They had dark eyes. They were pitch black and empty, truly empty. They were not reflecting any light. It was like a void. We booked it. We have not traveled in excess of 100 miles per hour before or since, but fuck, that day, it was warranted. We drove until we were in the next city, and then finally, we got out of the car again. And you want to know what the worst was about it? Not the eyes, not the stillness, not that horrible feeling, not that weirdo in the gas station who kept telling my mom and sister, my mama will like you, over and over, while mopping the same spot on the floor with a dry mop. Ew! It was the fact that we could not find this place on any map. We knew exactly where we had stopped on the interstate. We looked and we looked and we could not find it. It was not on Google Maps or any paper map we had. We even asked locals about the creepy gas station out on that stretch of road and got confused looks. There were people like, are you sure you weren't traveling on that highway instead or that interstate rather than the one you're saying? No, we knew where we had stopped it did not exist. Oh, my God. Oh, these stories freak me out because I'm like, what is this? Is this some parallel universe that you accidentally glitched into for a moment and this yeah. is always there and it's always this creepy and it's always this weird and you just accidentally were there? Or was this manipulation from some weird energy <sighs> and entity that was around? I don't know. And like it does – okay, have you seen Twin Peaks? No, but I, okay. I really want to go because I saw I saw Greg and Dana Newkirk, not to bring them up for the 100th time, <laughs> but I saw that they just went to the diner that I think was on Twin In the show. Yeah. Yeah, in the show. It is such a strange show. It's David Lynch. So if you know David Lynch, he has just a strange mind. But there are so many things in that show that are reminiscent of this and like just paranormal things generally and like timelines and glitches and it's so bizarre. But It really makes me think that they just went into some weird, alternate, creepy, parallel dimension that Mm. it's almost like the 11 mile road game where like you kind of just like transport and I'm shocked that there was another car there. Like I'm curious what these teenagers experienced. I know. Or it's even make me think of dreams too, where it's like, were 
the teenagers that were also there, were they actually there? Or was this just set up to make them feel a little bit more comfortable and question things a little bit less just for a moment, just to buy some time? I don't know. I also feel like they really just like br- like went way too casually over the fact that the guy inside the gas station told the mom and sister, my mama will like you. My yes. mama will like yes. you. Ugh. Ugh. Oh, I'm chills. Ugh. It also, Full body. <laughs> yeah, it's literally like, oh, growing growing my arm hair back. <laughs> <laughs> Remember when oh I like gosh. impromptu decided to shave my upper arm hair one night in a hotel? It was interesting that you chose upper. Normally people do like the lower and then leave the upper, but you did reverse. Well, because my lower would just be too much. And then I just, I don't know, I have one of those like face what are they called? The like microblades and microblades. Yeah, took it to my upper arm and was like, "Let's see what happens." I shave my arms sometimes. One girl in middle school told me that I should shave my arms because she also shaved hers, and I was like, "Okay." So I did it, and then it no longer grows just normal and flat. It is like straight up. So now I basically I shave them every once in a while when they get a little too crazy. I need a flat iron. A many many. Flat iron for my arm hair. For your arm hair? (laughs) Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Okay. This is called The Lady in Pink by These Ice 2313. Okay. This story may be nothing compared to other stories on Reddit, but to me, I was petrified when this happened. This took place in Wilmington, North Carolina when I was probably around 9 or 10, and my sister had been in a relationship for a few years and married to my brother-in-law. My brother-in-law is an ex-Marine, and he'd gotten out of the Marines and decided Civilian life just wasn't for him, and so he re-enlisted in the army. During his year of civilian life, they had started renting a duplex in a cul-de-sac. I was over there every other weekend to either help my sister distract my nephews like the good uncle I was while my sister worked, or I was staying over for the weekend. But whenever I was over there, I never saw this lady in her neighborhood. But back to the story. My brother-in-law had re-enlisted, and he was getting ready to be shipped off to MOS training, And of course, they were moving in with me and my parents, and so a month or so after they moved in with us, my sister wasn't getting her mail sent to our house. So while we were getting lunch one day, we were driving by her neighborhood and we decided we should drop in and retrieve her mail. And after she did, she called the post office to remind them about the address change and all of that. But then someone approached the front passenger side door while I was watching YouTube and they knocked on the window. Oh, creepy. Oh, I I just imagine the startle. Yeah. Yeah. I obviously got scared and I saw an old lady in a pink jacket wearing a straw hat, kind of like the ones that you see from Walmart. And keep in mind, this was in the middle of summer on the coast, so it was hotter than balls out. So why (laughs) she was wearing a jacket, I don't know, but my sister rolled down the window and the lady asked why she was grabbing the mail. My sister explained that she was the former resident and all that, and they engaged in a 15-minute conversation. And during this conversation, I felt so uncomfortable, like something about her was just off. My eldest nephew was in his car seat behind me, and the lady looked at me and then at my nephew and began talking about how we looked so alike and we look like her grandkids and how she takes her grandkids on vacation every year and how she bought her hat from the Bahamas. Again, it looked like it was a Walmart brand straw hat. And she even asked if I'd like to be her grandkid, which creeped me out. What? And my sister was also getting uncomfortable at this point as well. So we made an excuse for us to get going and the lady would walk off before my sister rolled up the window and got into the middle of the cul-de-sac before she saw the lady sprinting at us. (gasps) My sister said she was holding something, but I never asked what it was. My sister, of course, burnt rubber and raced out of that neighborhood and she never did call law enforcement for that. I'm pretty sure she doesn't remember it really, but the only reason I remember it was because of her face when she had come up to my window. She scared me. And reading these scary stories, I remembered that I had this one of my own. I don't know if this lady had the intention of taking me or my nephew or maybe killing us, but I never did want to find out what she was going to do. I no longer live in Wilmington anymore, and I'm pretty sure I'll never go back to that neighborhood again. (laughs) Is this the my mama will like you? Is this the the lady that the guy with the mama was talking about? This is mama. This is mama. Do you want to be my grandkid? It's just so freaky because it's like for an older woman, it's one thing if she's just making conversation, right? And she's like not really – she's being a watchful neighbor and 
she's not really understanding that some of the things she's saying might not be received the way that she's intending them to, to be like kind of a joking manner. You know, she's trying to build some rapport. Maybe. The thing is, when they are rolling up the window, already said their goodbye, it would never make sense for an old lady to be sprinting at them. No. If she was just like, you know, oh, shoot, there's some mail that you forgot and was like trying to wave it. Like, oh, wait, the mail. You wouldn't just oh, psycho run towards a car, right? Oh, gosh, that's so creepy. I know. I don't know what it is. Uh, yeah. What is her intention? His sister had only been gone for a month. And not to say more people couldn't have moved into that cul-de-sac, right. but like a cul-de-sac is small. You would think that within a month. You would know. I don't know. Yeah. And also, yeah, like they had never seen this woman before. I don't know. No. Sus. It is sus. Very. All right. This one's creepy, but it's short. Okay. Okay. This is from KMIA, KMIA official. When I was younger, around 14 or 15 years old, my family used to camp at a state park. Every night, my friend and I would walk through the woods, and we would call this our ritual. This particular night, we decided to walk further into the woods than usual. We had flashlights, but we like to try and navigate through the woods without them. So we were about half a mile from the nearest campsite in the dark when all of a sudden, we heard soft whispering behind us. Obviously, we turned on the flashlights and spun around to look behind us, and we didn't see anything. So we kept walking. And then we heard it again. This time we stop and we look around a bit before we decide to head back to our campsite. Then we see what was whispering. There on the ground was a lady crawling, whispering random words. Oh, no. <laughs> she was wearing dark clothes and was covered in dirt, crawling on the floor of the forest. Ew. Ew. When she sees that we notice her, she all of a sudden just stands up and declares that she was looking for her campsite. We end up walking back with her to the campground and try to help her find her group. Turns out she was just super drunk and was looking for the bathroom. Her friends didn't even notice she was missing, and if we hadn't gone that far into the woods, we have no idea what would have happened to her. It was very creepy. That is so weird. But also... On the flip side, I can – how do I say this? I think that <laughs> I have experienced a time where I've been so drunk and so, like, feeling out of place and kind of like I need to figure out where I am and what I'm doing that I think you get to a point where you're almost mentally breaking and you're trying to self-soothe. And I mm. can understand someone who's, like, physically super drunk and really disoriented also kind of whispering to herself, like, you're going to be okay. Yeah. You know, like, you just go here and blah, 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 you know? Like, I can understand yeah. that. But happening upon it is really freaky. And I think just because I have my, like, dark horror lenses on, I am I was picturing, like, like the really creepy, like, Samara bent arms, like, crawling on the ground. Yes. And she's, like, naked and kind of, like, <laughs> like, hair scraggly. But I do think yes. you're right. In that case, I am very glad that these – Reddit users did find her because, my gosh, who yes. knows what would have happened. Oh, my God, right? Yeah. People die that way. It's very scary. Terrifying. But also yes. so scary for them, too. It's like, what are you <laughs> going to encounter in the woods? Usually people think about mountain lions and bears. We think about this. But sometimes this, <laughs> yeah, the thing that can <laughs> stick with you the most is a drunk lady in the woods. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Whispering oh, and crawling okay. on the ground. Whispering and crawling. It's so creepy. It's just crawling. Crawling is so creepy, which it's like, why is it creepy? Babies do it. Shouldn't we think it's the cutest damn thing in the world? But no, it's creepy. It's cute when babies do it. It's not cute when like full-size humans are doing it and whispering things yeah. and like looking at you with like a crooked neck and like. And crawling way too fast. <sighs> yeah. I hate that imagery. Okay. This is from Lost Presentation 153. It's called Jogging Ghost Encounter. All right, so anytime from 2 a.m. to 5 a.m., I'll go for a jog. I'm usually up at this point, so it's kind of become a common thing now. Anyways, last night I left my house for a jog at around 3.30 a.m., and I jogged for almost an hour before I started heading back home. I'm about five blocks away from my house and on one straight path to the corner of my block. 
I jog two more blocks before I see a person two blocks up standing on the corner. I don't think much of this, even though it's around 4.30 a.m. now. I always see people out walking their dogs during my jog, and so it's nothing new to see somebody out at this time. I'm now about a block and a half away from this person, so I slow my pace because I'm coming up to an intersection, and I assume that they might have a dog with them, so I want to give them some time to start moving before I finish my final stretch home. I get to the intersection. I look out for cars. When I look straight ahead, I saw the person at the corner start to walk left around the corner. At this point, I finish walking across the street and then I pick up my pace again. I get to the corner that this person had been standing at and I look to my left in the direction that the person had gone. I initially did this to check for a car, but I looked farther back to see if the guy was alone or walking a dog. But when I looked, I saw that there was no one there. Now, it's not a big deal. Maybe he went into a car or something, I thought, but I'm nosy AF and I wanted to see (laughs) if somehow he made it to the other corner before I could see him. So I went up a block, I took a left on the corner, and I started heading back in the direction that I came, but one block over. I started heading back, and I run one block up, I get to the corner, I look around while I'm keeping my pace, and again, I see no one. At this point, I gave up on the person. I figure, maybe I'll just go two more blocks up, loop back, and then head home. I now get to the corner where I originally saw that person, and I take the left so that I could be on the straightaway to my block again. When I turned to the corner, I saw a person standing on that exact same corner. Now, I make it about a half a block up before I slow to a walking pace. I walk to the corner of the block I'm on, and I check for cars again. I look straight to the person, and they begin walking left, just like they did last time. I thought, wow, that is a coincidence, and I continued to cross the street. Now, I wear glasses, but when I jog, I always put them in my pocket because the sweat makes them slide off. I cross the street, I pick up my pace, and I get to the corner that the person was standing on. I stopped at this point. I looked to the left. Again, I saw no one. And I thought, surely I'm not that blind. I put on my glasses, (laughs) and I still can see no one in sight. I even took off my headphones to see if I could hear anything, and it was just quiet. Now, I know you might be thinking that I'm weird trying to see where these people are going, but to me it was a challenge to try to make it to their corner before they made it to the end of the block. So at this point, I'm thinking, damn, I lost the challenge. Let me do another loop. So another loop I did, and when I go to the corner, I see a person. I look (gasps) to the left and instantly stop in my tracks. I saw another person standing on that exact same corner. I put my glasses on again so that I can see better, and I start walking forward while looking at this person. I couldn't make out if they were facing me or not, But I thought there's no way that three times in a row someone would be standing on this exact corner when I get here. And I started to feel like I was in this loop at this point, like it was some weird ass deja vu. Anyways, this person does not move an inch. I walk to the corner. I get ready to check for cars. But before I do, I stay locked on this person to see if they're going to walk to the left like the others did. But they don't move. I look to my right to see if there's a car coming. And then I look towards the person and they're beginning to walk left. Now I'm hesitant to cross. Why did they only move now? Surely it's not a coincidence that this has happened three times now. Yeah. I took a minute before continuing to walk. I get to the corner where they were on. I look in that direction that they went and nothing. Now I'm confused. They didn't seem to be walking fast. So surely I would have seen someone. So I figured, let me just go walk that way that they did and see how long it would take to walk it. I have my glasses on and headphones out at this point and I look around and no one is around at all. So I begin to walk. I make it a quarter way up the block when I get a chill down my spine. Oh, no. I stop walking. I take a second to try and understand why I'm feeling this way, and I look behind me, and someone is standing at that corner again. I don't know what to do other than turn around and continue to walk. When I go to turn, I see in my peripheral vision that this person has started to move. I turn back around, and they are now walking in my direction. From the little time that I had to turn back again, I tried to see the person's face, but it was just dark. They seemed to have like a hoodie on or something. We are now both walking in the same direction, and I can hear their footsteps from behind. They're not close, but they're audible. I make it about halfway up the block before I decide to just peek over my shoulder only to see no one's behind me. I just heard their footsteps. So I now stop completely. I turn around. I confirm no one is there. Sure enough, no one is there. And my heart instantly drops to my ass. 
I'm now standing <laughs> facing the corner where I saw this person and no one is on the block and I'm trying to calm myself a little bit and think. Maybe I was hearing my own footsteps or something? I turn around to just continue on home when I see someone up the block, now sprinting in my direction. <gasps> Why? Why are they all doing this? <laughs> now it's 4.30 a.m. and it's very quiet outside. I can hear crickets loudly chirping, but the person in full sprint heading towards me is completely silent. No sound of shoes hitting the pavement. No sound of anyone breathing. I was just frozen, trying to make sense of what was happening, staring at the shadowy person running right at me. All I could do was stare, watch them get closer and closer until they were about 10 feet away from me, and then they disappeared, like they were never even there to begin with. I snapped back into reality and just started taking off towards home. I was in a full sprint until I got inside. I locked the doors and I showered trying to make sense of this experience. I figured I'd come on here and share it and get someone's thoughts on the matter. This is my first post. I apologize about the writing. Anyway, let me know your thoughts. What the heck? And obviously everyone's like, ah, I think that was paranormal, my friend. <laughs> and also like, this is their neighborhood, right? Like they run in the morning all the time. So like why Every this morning. experience? Yeah. My first thought is someone died on that corner on this day, however many years ago. I don't know. And maybe perhaps they've been trying to like make contact and communicate with someone. Yeah. And finally, this guy sees them in the morning and this spirit is trying to like make contact but keeps like disappearing. And then finally, like, I don't know, it's terrifying the like running after yeah. him. I don't know. Trying to make something positive out of this terrifying thing. Right. And it's like every time the jogger looks up, the person on the street corner turns and walks away. I don't know. It was almost like it was trying to get him to follow, but like he needed to follow in a certain amount of time and to a certain place. But he was always like delayed or like took the other loop. Yeah, I don't know. I also kept expecting every time they put their glasses on and like turned for like the person to be like right there. Right there. It's so scary. I mean, and also like clearly it was so scary because this person was frozen on the spot, like watching this figure sprint towards them. And luckily it disappeared. But like, what if it didn't? <laughs> what if it didn't? And we would probably not have this story. I think the lesson here is don't run at four in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe like find a running group to go with a couple people, <laughs> some running buddies. So that you're not completely alone, a yeah. target to both humans who have ill intent and also, I guess, the paranormal who might be a little overly curious about you as well. Creatures. Creatures of the Creatures night. Creatures of the night. That's what they uh, call us when they see us after our tour. Creatures <laughs> of the night. <laughs> I think we started out as creatures. So <laughs> That's true. We're only getting more comfortable in our, our state of being. Okay. I have two stories, but I'm just going to read the last one because it's a little bit longer, and it's that's all I'll say. Okay. It is from Wispified. I was eight years old when I first moved into this house with my family, and it was on the edge of the forest. My parents had their doubts about buying a house with a backyard boarded by the forest. They had concerns about wild animals getting into our bins or hurting our dogs, and they were worried one of us might go too far into the trees and get lost. But it was cheap. And my dad liked the seclusion, and my mom loved the house itself. And my siblings and I were super excited about playing in the backyard and exploring the forest. Our first sign that something wasn't right was that our dogs were absolutely terrified of the forest. They never went into the forest for any reason. If a toy they had been playing with found its way past the tree line, they refused to retrieve it. And when one of us went in, they would pace anxiously until we returned. On occasion, we'd notice the dog staring at a spot in the forest in obvious distress, sometimes growling or barking. But we, my family and I, could never see anything in there. My brother once carried one of the dogs into the trees to show her there was nothing scary about it, but she wriggled out of his grip and sprinted back to the house in a panic. If we were in the backyard when it was getting dark, we sometimes would hear noises like, Someone was walking through the forest, sticks crunching underfoot, branches being pushed aside. If we called out, there would be no response. But if we shined a flashlight around, 
we would occasionally catch a glimpse for just a split second of something that we swear looked like a person walking around in the dark. So my parents very quickly banished us from entering the forest after dark. And even during the day, we weren't really allowed to go out of sight of the house. My sister's bedroom window looked out at the backyard and the forest beyond. And she remembers looking out her window one night and seeing a shadowy figure standing right at the edge of the backyard. She said there was something wrong with it. Like it wasn't quite standing on the ground and it was a little too tall to be a person. And it seemed distorted. And yet my sister was convinced that it was staring at her. She called for our dad saying there was a man in the yard staring at her through the window. And when he ran to go chase it off, she continued to watch the figure. It didn't move. It didn't move away. It stayed standing in that position. But when the light from our dad's flashlight passed over it, suddenly it wasn't there anymore. What in the world? We regularly heard knocking at our back door at night. No one was ever there. Our parents thought it was just teenagers playing pranks and stopped bothering even opening the door until one rainy night. There was knocking and it was persistent and agitated. So my mom pointed out that maybe someone really did need help. When she opened the door, not only was no one there, but there were wet footprints on the porch. Stop! No! (laughs) The knocking continued the whole time we lived there. It would happen several times in the span of a few weeks and then stop for a few months. Then it would start up again. Eventually, my parents had a security camera installed, but we never, ever caught anyone at the door. But the camera wasn't completely useless. About three years into living in this house, my brother started having night terrors and sleepwalking. When he would sleepwalk, he would always go out the back door and start walking towards the forest. My mom, being a light sleeper, would hear the door open and run to get him before he made it into the forest. After the third or fourth time it happened, my brother asked to see the camera footage. Maybe he thought it would be funny to see how he looked sleepwalking. The footage showed him walking out to the porch, then pausing as if listening to something, shaking his head, and then reluctantly walking forward as if being pulled or forcefully guided by something. Ew. How did he make it back out? I think his mom would always grab him. Oh, God. One evening... My dad was in the backyard and he heard my sister calling him from the forest, seemingly in distress. Thinking that she had gone exploring in the forest and fallen over and hurt herself, he ran in and started calling to her. But quickly he realized it was too dark to see her and he couldn't pinpoint where her voice was coming from. So he told her to wait where she was and he would grab a flashlight. When he ran back into the house, he saw my sister inside, safe and completely unharmed. At the time, my dad had not told us about hearing my sister's voice in the forest. So a couple months later, when I heard my mom's voice coming from the forest, I was outside with the dogs. I didn't question it. Even though I had remembered seeing my mom inside recently, but I hadn't noticed her walk past me, but I heard my mom calling to me, saying she had Mm -hmm. gotten her sweater caught in some branches and needed me to come in and help her. So of course, I walked in. As I started walking in, the dogs began barking, alerting my dad, who saw me through the window wandering into the forest. He came outside and called to me. I said, I'm just helping mom. He yelled so loud, telling me I needed to run back to the house as fast as I could, which I did. Oh, can you imagine being told that? I would panic. I would panic. My mom was inside the house. (laughs) Oh, I'm so grateful for these dogs. I know. Trust your pets, man. Trust your pets. Trust your pets. After this, my parents built a fence around the backyard and started looking for a new place. In the time between the fence being built and us moving out, it got way worse. We'd hear knocking at the door more regularly, as well as tapping on the windows as if someone was walking the perimeter of the house, trying every possible entrance. We would often hear scratching and scraping sounds on the fence. We would hear voices beyond it. My brother's night terrors got more frequent, and one night my mom didn't hear the door open, and when he went sleepwalking, my brother woke up standing at the fence, staring into the forest with the dogs barking at him. The very last morning we spent there, less than four years after we moved in, we woke up to find the back door fully open. 
and the security footage showed that the door slowly swung open on its own. Since moving out, my brother's sleepwalking has stopped, though he still gets night terrors and suffers from pretty severe anxiety. A few nights ago, he called me out of the blue, and after a bit of small talk, he asked me if I think the door being opened that final night means that whatever was out there finally got inside. He was trying to make light of it, saying he was getting into the spirit of Halloween, joking about how maybe we should all get exercised just in case something latched on to all of us all those years ago. Mm -hmm. But I really think he's deeply bothered by everything that happened. I know I still am. I still get nervous around dark wooded areas, and I really don't know what was out there, what was behind our house in the forest at night. But I get the feeling that given the chance, it would have swallowed us whole. It's so confusing because I also kind of feel like it did have a few chances, you know? Right. But someone always intervened. I guess the only time it didn't was the time, I guess the fence was there, but his brother woke up standing at the fence. Right. Or even like when the dad went to go follow their voice. I know. Well, the only reason he realized he didn't have a flashlight, remember? And he was like, I'll be right back. It's weird because it's like they get to the forest edge. And is that the perimeter? It doesn't really make sense that that would be the perimeter and that they're waiting for the person to step into the forest when it's literally – well, think about all the chances that it had when it's banging on the door. They open the door and then where is it? Right. Because this is is so flesh pedestrian. It's so creepy. Like everything about it is just like – Black-eyed kids, vampires, like something's trying to get inside the house. Right. And then, yeah, why did the door slowly open? Like what what finally allowed it to get inside? And did it? Or is this, again, just an attempt to get someone outside, you know? Like if it's like open the door yeah, and lure people outside at that moment because they're like, uh-oh, who's outside? Let me go yeah. check. Did someone – is it one of my dogs out here? I don't know. I'm also scared that like – Anytime before they put the security camera in, like, how do they know that they caught the brother who had been sleepwalking every time? Like, how do they know before the security camera, like, oh my gosh, I've gotten chills consistently throughout this whole episode, but especially this story. It is freaky and it's like the wet feet. That kind of reminds me of Crone of Catskills too. Yeah. And it's just, the whole thing feels very flesh pedestrian to me. We won't say the real world word. If we're not supposed yeah. to. And I won't even say FP again because third time I'm just not not even going to risk done. it. Yeah. We're done. But it does also make me think, what if there was someone who passed in a really tragic way? Like maybe their car went into a pond or something if there was like a lake nearby because the like dripping wet feet and like knocking like they need help. Mm. And just even like calling for people's names in distress, even if it's mimicking someone else's voice or someone else's name, it does make me think that even if it's not like an active haunting where there's a spirit who is trapped there after that they didn't get out, you know, like they died, they drowned, or they just never found help. I don't know. It also makes me think what if there's just like an energy, like what if the woods, what if the trees remember what happened to this person and they're just reenacting it over and over again? But that seems like sad and not terrifying. Like I feel like whatever this is has really, really bad intentions. Like it is not good and trees are good. We love trees. Trees are nice. I know. I need to go hug my tree and tell my poor tree that unfortunately we have to cut it down because of safety. (laughs) Makes me sad. You should save the stump. You should do something really cool where you like hollow it out and then plant other things inside of it. Oh, interesting. I was going to ask to keep it all for firewood. (laughs) (laughs) But I did put my hand on the tree yesterday and I was like, thank you so much for feeding all the wildlife because it produces acorns and like the deer come into the backyard and they eat the acorns and the squirrels and the chipmunks are like always here. And I'm like, thank you for doing this. Thank you. Now I have to let it know that it only has a few more weeks here. It's a beautiful tree. You should um have like I a know. little ceremony. I don't know, like a little like ritual saying goodbye. Th- yeah. I mean, you have thanked it. That's really nice. But if you can honor it. I just feel bad for the other trees too. I feel bad for this tree, but I feel like the other trees are about to hate me. They're going to watch me take down their friend. 
maybe now all the other trees are going to flourish even more because they don't have to share nutrients with this one. True. But also my deal with Ryan, I mean, we both agree. Like it's a, it's definitely a safety concern. We have to take it down. But I was like, I feel so bad. And he was like, we could plant like five, six other trees. I was like, great. We'll plant other trees in areas that are not a safety hazard, literally on top of the house. (laughs) So one of my favorite things that I did growing up was at our house, the one we lived in in Branchburg, we each had a tree. And so sweet. Like as kids at a certain age, we all planted a tree. And I don't know if my tree still is alive, but I drove past it and my brother's tree is still there and like thriving. Oh, that's so nice. I love yeah. that. That's so sweet. Plant a tree for your children. Okay, we we did a so on Campfire Stories, which we did yesterday, you and I, we had Litha, who's one of our nearest and dearest, most haunted friends on Patreon do tarot cards and pull cards for a bunch of people. She did some past life readings. And then for us, she did a past life reading and how we were connected with one another in a past life. I can't remember what the like last card was, like what the poll was, but it was basically like something about our our union as people and as souls. And it was the star, right? Is that what it was called? Mm -hmm. And the photo depicted someone who was one foot in the water, one foot on land. And it was supposed to basically represent like one foot in the woo-woo, one foot in the here and now. But it also, we were vibing with it because we we're like, well, I'm the, the one who touches grass and hugs trees and you're the one who like steps into the ocean and melts in the rain. Yeah. It was just like a really cool moment. Mm-hmm. Actually, did Litha email us all of that? Because that would be so fun to read. We'll have to do it in another one. Or if people want to go rewatch Litha's uh, reading, it's on Campfire Stories. And if you're in any active tier on Patreon, you can watch Campfire Stories at any time. Previous, new, old, all of those things. Yes. It was the October 24th Campfire Stories. Yeah. We have one week left of tour when this episode comes out. This is November 5th. And happy Mm. birthday to my dad, by the way. And we have one week left. Four shows. Denver is our last one. We have Phoenix, we have Vegas, and we have Salt Lake City and Denver. Those are our last four. And we still have more flights ahead of us just for personal. I know. Personal trips. When will I sleep? Actually, it's so funny. My aura ring said that I had 19 minutes of sleep on Sunday night. That's wild. I mean, you stayed up a lot later than I did. And I was like, yeah, 2.45 a.m. went to bed. Yeah. But it was fun. So everyone... I feel like everyone loves Reddit. Everyone loves reading creepy stories. If you Mm -hmm. haven't already, go get lost in Reddit. Share with us your favorite Reddit stories. On Patreon, I posted like, what are your favorite Reddit stories? And someone shared this thread about the staircase in the woods. And in the new year, I'm doing a full episode on it. Oh, I cannot wait. Also, can I tell you my favorite, which isn't, it's not like lore or a real story. It was completely written by someone and I think purchased. The rights of it to it were purchased by like Warner Brothers or something like that. Oh, cool. I'll link it in the show notes because it is not something we could cover on the podcast because I think to read it would probably take a full three or four hours of saying it out loud. It's multiple parts. It's by Vado Carbon. And it's called, my wife and I bought a ranch in the mountains last year, and my neighbor had some interesting suggestions on how to manage our land. And it's all about like each season, something wild happens where it's like something paranormal that you have to survive. And you never know when exactly it's going to happen in the season, but it does. And you have to go through these like certain rituals to survive it. And it's freaky and it's so entertaining, but like It is a great thing if it's snowing or raining outside to just sit down, curl up on the couch when you have a few spare hours and read through this like five-part incredible series. So cool. You know what it reminds me of is um, the Hunger Games where it's like the clock and at every hour something different happens. Yes. It's similar-ish. What am I reading right now? I just read The Only One Left by Riley Sager. Really enjoy. Highly recommend. We were recommended The House of of leaves or something like that, which is like an old horror. Like you can't even find it on Kindle. You have to buy like the hard copy and it's like hard to find. Oh, did you read that one yet? No, I just ordered it. And then also if anyone was, let me see if I still have it pulled up because Jenny was speaking the other day about a book on campfire stories. Oh, The Crone's Book of Words by Valerie Wirth. 
Is that the one with the spells? The spell book. Yes. Yeah. Let's all become witches. We'll link everything in the show notes to all of these suggestions so people can find them easily. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Yes. Thank you. We hope to see you at our final couple shows if we haven't already seen you. We love you. We love you. And we will see see you you on the other side.